Namaste. Uh, good evening. Three months ago, we marked the 50th anniversary of President Nixon's visit to China in February 1972. That event was a masterstroke of diplomacy. It stunned the world and altered the course of the Cold War in a manner highly favorable to U.S. interests. Above all, it illustrated the vital importance for diplomacy of leaders who could rise above conventional thinking, spot opportunities, and act decisively in pursuit of a strategic objective, qualities that are all too rare in world history. At the moment, the United States and China are engaged in conventional thinking. They are talking past each other on important issues that affect the overall bilateral relationship. With respect to both words and actions, the explicit and implicit messages sent by each side are often interpreted by the other in a manner contrary to the intent of the sender. For this situation to exist between the two most consequential countries in the world is potentially dangerous and is contributing to the sharp worsening in US PRC bilateral relations in recent years. The Biden administration has defined three components of the relationship, competition, cooperation, and confrontation. Its preference seems to be for steady state competition as the goal. In other words, to stabilize competition as the main characteristic. In contrast, President Xi Jinping has insisted the goal should be peaceful coexistence. This is an important difference. This cloudy outlook will be significantly influenced by three factors. The first is the degree of hostility in domestic attitudes toward China and toward globalization more general, both of which are without precedent in the last half century, the degree of hostility. This is limiting the administration's willingness to consider trade agreements or other measures to improve relations with Beijing. The second is the slowness of the administration in defining an economic strategy for the Indo-Pacific. During President Biden's visit to Japan last week, the administration took a first step toward addressing this problem by launching the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity with a dozen Asian partners. This new trade agreement has the right membership, but is a pale shadow of what the Asian countries had been hoping for. The third factor is the Taiwan issue, which is an albatross around the neck of the administration. Senior officials from the president on down have not mastered the terminology of its own China policy. The one China framework agreed on when Washington and Beijing established diplomatic relations has stood the test of time. Within it, Taiwan has prospered as never before, achieving a per capita income equivalent to that of Canada. Ten years ago, cross-trade relations were thriving and tensions were low. This is no longer the case. President Xi Jinping has referred to Taiwan as a ticking time bomb. The principal reason for this downturn is the refusal of the current Taiwan government to acknowledge a one China framework in any form. The U.S. government chose not to confront Taiwan over this issue, hoping that maintaining the status quo based on earlier affirmations of the 92 consensus on one China would be sufficient. This was a misreading of the importance of the one China principle in Beijing. In essence, we have been sucked into a vicious cycle in which Beijing increases military pressure on Taiwan to deter moves toward independence, and the United States responds by strengthening military ties to Taiwan, which Beijing considers a violation of the normalization arrangement. Breaking out of this vicious cycle should be a major policy goal for both Washington and Beijing. The United States claims to be adherent to a one China policy based on the three joint communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act, and the six assurances. And yet President Biden stated bluntly during his just concluded visit to Japan that the United States will defend Taiwan if it is attacked. The language of the Taiwan Relations Act specifies that the President and the Congress shall determine in accordance with constitutional processes appropriate action by the United States in response to any such danger. Despite the importance of this issue, senior U.S. officials are sloppy and inconsistent in how they refer to Taiwan, sometimes calling it a country or an ally, 
Some examples follow. U.S. officials sometimes omit references to the three joint communiques as the basis for the U.S. one China policy, instead of basing it on the Taiwan Relations Act, which omits any reference to a one China policy. Both the Trump and the Biden administrations have been tolerant of congressional actions inconsistent with the one China policy, including presidential signing of non-binding bills containing language incompatible with the administration's declared policy. To an objective outside observer, the United States of reality seems to be pursuing a one China, one Taiwan policy. The United States has significantly raised the level of officiality in dealing with Taiwan. Even though the government on Taiwan refuses to acknowledge any form of a one China framework, the United States continues to support more international space for Taiwan in the community of nations. In both the Trump and Biden administrations, Washington has sought to discourage countries still recognizing the Republic of China on Taiwan as the government of China from switching recognition to the PRC, whose government is recognized by the United States as the sole legal government of China. On the military front, U.S. defense officials have begun referring to the strategic importance of Taiwan for the United States in beating the China challenge. PRC military operations near Taiwan or in Taiwan's air defense identification zone, intended to deter Taiwan from taking further steps toward independence, are interpreted by the United States as signaling Beijing's intent to invade Taiwan. U.S. military actions with respect to Taiwan are blurring the distinction between ensuring Taiwan has adequate defensive capabilities and treating Taiwan as a de facto military ally encountering China's growing military power. In conclusion, I need to point out the obvious, which is that Russia's naked aggression against Ukraine has fundamentally altered the international situation. It has also given rise to speculation as to whether Putin's bold action to recover what he claims to be former Russian territory in Ukraine will inspire Xi Jinping to advance his own time table for recovery of Taiwan. It is premature to draw any firm conclusions on such questions, since it's still far from clear what the outcome in Ukraine will be. Nevertheless, it's vitally important for the United States not to misread the lessons we should draw from the conflict in Ukraine. Such misreading is made more likely by the determination of opponents of NATO eastward expansion to deny that this played any role in precipitating Russia's aggression in Ukraine. This is simply not supported by the record. In his Munich speech in 2007, Putin warned that NATO expansion represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. A year later, he repeated his warning that Moscow would view any attempt to expand NATO to Russia's borders as a direct threat. In 2008, current CIA Director Bill Burns, then the American ambassador to Moscow, wrote to Secretary of State Rice saying, quote, Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, I have yet to find anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests." Unquote. Such warnings, of course, in no way justify Putin's, Putin's blatant violation of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbor Ukraine, but they illustrate the danger of ignoring sharply drawn red lines by a powerful nuclear-armed country. Applying this lesson in, in the Indo-Pacific, the reddest of red lines for Beijing is the formal separation of Taiwan from China. Beijing has made it crystal clear for decades, long before it began its military modernization process, that it will use military force if necessary to prevent that development. Now Beijing has formidable military capabilities for enforcing that red line, and yet the United States is inching in the direction of a one China, one Taiwan policy. Instead of seeking to reduce the threat, we are principally relying on military deterrence to force all such action without halting the provocations. 
Given these considerations, it is safe to say that the crisis in Europe will have an impact on U.S.-China relations, whose nature will depend on, to a significant degree on the quality of U.S. diplomacy. And I would argue at the moment, we're refusing to understand the roots of these red lines and are edging to cross them. Very dangerous. We are indeed living in troubled times. Thank you.